So now we're going to leave our planet and head off to Mars. And to take us there, I'm very pleased to welcome Roberto Orose. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure and a honor to be here today. So we will be talking about Mars and what has to do Mars with Earth. Well, if I showed you this picture, and I didn't tell you this was taken on Mars by the Curiosity rover, you would think we are, except for the reddish color of the sky, somewhere in the, well, southwestern United States maybe, or even Sahara Desert. So Mars looks a lot like Earth, except for the lack of life. The problem is that Mars is actually much harsher than the Earth. What we see here in this picture is not what it feels to be like on Mars. Temperature on average is well below zero, and at the poles reach, reaches minus 100 centigrades. Air is very thin, the atmosphere is made of CO2, and it's less than 1% of the pressure we experience on Earth. Also, this is the very driest desert one can think of. If all the humidity of Mars could precipitate at once, it would form a layer no more than 10 microns thick. So it's drier than any desert of Earth could ever be. Now, there are signs that things were very different in the past. And this is the kind of things that has given us clues about the distant past of Mars. In place, we see river beds, we see lakes, but they are all dry. This one in particular is called an outflow channel. It has been probably produced by a single catastrophic event of water release, the like of which current Earth has never seen. So Mars in the past had different climate. It had to have a different climate because otherwise water could not exist on its surface. But to this, for, uh, for this to happen, it took a different atmosphere. Uh, made of CO2, much, but much denser than the one uh, that exists today, and which would form a cause, a beneficial this time, greenhouse effect, capable of raising temperature above the melting point of water. However, things changed pretty soon. Mars being much smaller than the Earth, having a weaker gravitational pull, it could retain its atmosphere over the ages. Also, uh, the uh, the Mars lost its magnetic field very early in its history, and our magnetic field protects our atmosphere from erosion by the solar wind, the flux of particles that constantly is emitted by the sun and hits us. But without a magnetic field, the process of atmospheric loss accelerated. Finally, all this was compounded by the seizing, the, uh, the, 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 the decay of volcanic activity to almost negligible level, uh, and volcanic activity is important, both on Earth and on Mars, to provide gases to the atmosphere, as well as a source of, source of heat. So this led to the early demise of Mars, but there is still water there in the uh, polar caps. But this is not enough to explain all the water features that we see. What we think, and what has been already observed, is that there is also ice in the ground on Mars. But the problem is we don't know how much and how deep it, it's there. The fact is that Mars is still hot in its interior, and as you go deeper, temperature increases, so that if uh, ice reaches deep enough, there will be a point at which ice will melt because temperature has increased to, the, to zero centigrade. So looking for water on Mars, liquid water on Mars today, means looking for subsurface water. This has a search that has been going on, at least if we are talking about stable water, of course. This search has been going on for, for a long time, and luckily only this year we have been able to, to show that there, are, there is a particular place in the South Pole on Mars uh, where under one and a half kilometer of ice you have what seems to be liquid water. Uh, there are, uh, it, it has been discovered by uh, a radar called Marsis aboard the European spacecraft Mars Express. And basically, it's similar to the radars that are used on Earth to detect subglacial lakes in places like Antarctica. So uh, what we have found here is uh, liquid water that, but however, this liquid water is not at zero centigrade. There are indications that this water is saturated with salts 
So it's not the kind of water you want to see come out, coming out of your tap. But still, these salts being very likely uh, perchlorate salts, uh, there are bacteria on Earth that could use such salts for their own metabolism. So the discovery of this water for the first time on Mars presents us with a real possibility that there is an environment safe for life on Mars where existing life forms on Earth would be able to survive. And if Mars in the past, in its uh, temperate age, has developed life, maybe life is still there waiting for us to discover. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. What an exciting prospect. Now, to help you continue in this exploration of water on Mars and other places out there in the solar system, please may I also welcome your moderator, Julian Zirath, Stefan Hell, and John Grotzinger. So I'd like to welcome you all to this panel, Water on Mars. And Roberto, thank you for setting the stage for us all. And I'm joined here by Stefan and John. And I think for the next 20 minutes, we want to have a really lively dialogue and discussion on topics that are really related to water on Mars and how that influences on our own planet. So Stefan, I want to start with you. You've spent most of your life behind the lens of a microscope. So why is it important for us to look for water on other planets? Well, I think uh, there are two fundamental reasons from my viewpoint, and one is the simple fact that uh, water is a very abundant substance in the universe, I'd say the second most abundant substance. And so um, we need to understand where does it come from, actually? Was it made in a single event? How is it distributed? Has it changed? How was it formed on Earth uh, or not formed? Does it, does it come from somewhere? That's one of the reasons. The second reason is, of course, the life as we know it, at least, uh, requires liquid water, and we need to understand, has there been similar events outside this Earth as well? So I'm going to go to John. Was it a surprise, the discovery of water on Mars? I, I think every time uh, we have a vehicle that looks down at the surface of Mars from orbit, or a lander or a rover that, that then confirms that there was once water on the on the surface of Mars, it's always a great discovery. It just seems so improbable based on just looking at the planet today. So, Roberto, you talked a little bit about the existence of life. So, what do we need for the emergence of life from planets like Mars or other ecoplanets? And what's an ecoplanet, by the way? Well, I think that the fair answer is that we don't know. Uh, we're not able to create life in the lab. We know that the elements that are uh, necessary to life are essentially uh, life as we know it is, is liquid water and an amount, uh, a certain amount of uh, carbon, uh, nitrogen, oxygen and other elements and we need a source of energy but we don't know if this is enough to, to start the process, we don't know. So what do we need for a habitable life on a planet like Mars? We're basically putting a lot of efforts into making expeditions outside of this planet ourselves. What do you think we needed for a habitable life there? I mean, obviously water is going to be one of them because that's the theme of this whole meeting. Well, um, looking for water on Mars and looking for signs of extant or extinct life to, uh, is to me connected to a more a grander question, which is, is life common in the universe? As I, as I just said, um, on Earth, uh, it's difficult to, to understand the whole entire process leading from, from inorganic Earth to the simplest form of life. And maybe exploring Mars is a way to bypass our ignorance and go directly for the answer. If we were to find that life exists or existed on Mars, we would have to conclude that life occurs whenever there are the conditions that we think are necessary, that there is no special happening required for that. And we would be led to conclude also that life must be abundant in the universe. Do you have a sense of how much water is there under the surface of Mars? Uh, you know, I think that the, uh, uh, as Roberto was saying during his, uh, his presentation, we really know now that with a high degree of certainty that there was once a lot more water uh, than exists now, and for reasons that he described, the atmosphere was lost. 
And, and really the trick is when you go through the architecture of building a, a mission like the Curiosity rover um, and pick a landing site, you, you have to hope that what you will find is, is immediately a place where there was once water that was present, that you'll be able to use your analytical instruments to, to look for the key elements of life, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and we found all those. How do you read that? Well, so you have instruments that, that will then give you an inventory of those elements, but then also tell you the minerals that they're in. And that's very important because that tells you about the, the redox, you know, is iron in the plus two state or the plus three state. Because microorganisms, in order to survive and be habitable, need to be able to work with those electron flows. I mean, you're a physicist. What kind of tools <laughs> do you mean, think we're going to need? Uh, well, possibly a microscope to look at the details. But <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a question for you. I mean, you mentioned that there was an atmosphere on Mars probably and uh, uh, there was uh, water on Mars most likely. So why did the water disappear or what are the conditions actually for holding uh, the water on a certain planet? I think that uh, from what we know today, uh, most of the water on Mars has left with the atmosphere. So as, as the atmosphere was being dragged away and lost in space, even water in there was, was lost. But again, uh, the big possibility is that a lot of water is still waiting for us in the subsurface and perhaps the liquid water found under the polar cap is just the beginning. It's ch deeper into, into the crust in areas which are more difficult to probe with the radar. Uh, ice is very transparent to radar waves. Couldn't have more liquid water and, and, and a real environment. This is possible. We started a little bit with Stefan, why look? And I would just maybe want to ask you maybe to discuss why is it important to know this and how is it important for us to understand more about ourselves from understanding water on Mars? Can we learn anything about our own planet from that study? John, go ahead. You know, I, I always like to say to my students that if we never find life on Mars, you can still make lemonade out of lemons because it's, it's not a sister, but it's a close cousin in terms of its earliest first billion years. And there may be remnants of prebiotic compounds that were important to leading to the evolution of life on Earth that are no longer preserved on Earth because plate tectonics turns everything over. But Mars is like in a state of suspended animation, maybe with the very beginning materials. That's for you. Well, what are we going to learn about ourselves from understanding water <laughs> on Mars? Well, <laughs> again, I, I, maybe I'm going a bit uh, off the topic here. But again, this is to me is tied to the perception of our place in the order of things. And knowing about life and its occurrence in the universe to me, will have a, such a cultural and philosophical impact on our lives that cannot be compared to anything we have discovered before. If we just think the fact that by moving the center of the universe from the Earth to the Sun has led essentially to, to modern democracy because it, it was the telling blow to the theocratic oppression system born out of feudalism. Let's imagine, nobody can imagine fully what would happen if we were to find life on Earth or, or outside the Earth or or not, actually. <laughs> That's from you? Well, I think um, uh, it's, it's very important to realize that uh, it might be very hard to have life on other planets. And I think this, this, this search for, for liquid water and for, and for life on other planets and the difficulties uh, that you have to take just prove that Earth, in a way, is very special. And so, in the end, we have to make sure that the Earth is preserved, and, and I think the, the search for life on, on other plants will tell us how precious actually our Earth is. We talked a little bit, because we did some prep, but extraterrestrial intelligence, and I think maybe you might have brought that up in the early discussions. Maybe you can say a few words about that, because in the search for water, we're also looking for new knowledge and intelligence, but talk a little bit about extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, the search so far has been uh, what limited. is it, first of all? And oh, then, yeah. oh, search for yeah. extraterrestrial intelligence. This essentially means uh, looking for signals that are not natural, that are artificial in nature, coming from the rest of the universe. This has been done using radio telescopes because radio waves seem to be a very convenient vehicle for information across stellar distances, but the search so far has been fruitless. However, uh, our efforts compared to the magnitude of the task have been very limited. And in fact, by 
accounting for accounting for the, the area of space and the band of frequencies and the way in which the signal can be modulated, all our efforts amount to collecting uh, f a single glass of water from the ocean and expecting to find a fish there. <laughs> Most of us have enough trouble communicating with each other, and now we want to communicate with the rest of our solar system. But can we use water for that? Is there any thought about that? Well, water is for sure, uh, or for sure, at least uh, very likely the basis of life everywhere in the universe. Um, there are several factors for that. The fact that it is a very abundant compound, the fact that it has thermal and physical properties that are very favorable for the kind of chemistry life requires. The fact that it remains liquid at a range of temperatures at which carbon, uh, uh, let's say, uh, compounds remain stable. So all of these, and, and carbon being a very common compound in the universe as, as well. So life uh, seems to have, I mean, a very reasonable blueprint for life would include uh, water and carbon. So there's, there's, it's difficult to think out of that. So, of course, it's possible. Well, I want to take a little bit of time now just to kind of wrap up and give each of you an opportunity to just share with us what you hope for going forward. And I thought maybe I'd start with you, John. What do you hope for because of this kind of research and this kind of new insight? Yeah, I think if I just pick up on that last theme a little bit, if you take a glass of seawater and look for microorganisms, you're going to find them every time. <laughs> and earlier in the session today, somebody said every second breath of air comes from the ocean. Those won't be from higher organisms. Those are from microorganisms. And so what I hope for is that we are able to find the funding and continue to build the James Webb Space Telescope to aim at extrasolar planets and, and look for, in the composition of their atmosphere, look for oxygen. Because if you looked at Earth from another solar system, in addition to being able to look at its size, mass, density, and all those fundamental physical variables, the minute you looked at its atmosphere with a spectrometer, you would see oxygen. It's a fundamental property of the Earth that belongs to life. So my hope is that someday we may discover an exoplanet with an oxygen-rich atmosphere. Okay, that would be really exciting. How about uh, you, Roberto? Well, um, I, I subscribe to what Dr. Uh, Grotzinger has said. I would also add that, uh, to me, space exploration uh, for this kind of endeavor would be a great opportunity for uh, giving us hope, um, giving us a sense of belonging and a perspective for the future. I think that uh, being, having been born in the years of the uh, of the first man on the moon uh, shaped my perception of the world and uh, directed by my life and uh, this sense of destiny of having something important to do seems to have been completely lost now and this is something I'm really missing How about you there? I think uh, the search for water on other planets uh, is a uh, purely curiosity-driven science, and I like that very much. And I very much hope that something surprising comes out <laughs> um, uh, that, that no one expects and tells uh, how fun science is and, of course, how many insights, fundamental insights, as you mentioned, science can give. And um, uh, secondly, uh, of course, I hope very much that, that people understand um, the value of the environment that we have and the uniqueness uh, that we have and that we really have to work hard to sort out our conflicts on this planet in order to keep it uh, habitable for us. So we hear a lot about blue sky research and this is probably going to be blue water research. And Absolutely. So the final thing I want to bring up though is a lot of the people here are young aspiring chemists, physicists, um, biomedical researchers um, and also interested in the cult culture. But what advice would you give to young people that are really about to embark upon their careers based on the kinds of insight that you have. I'll start with you. You teach a lot of students, so what advice do you give them about? I, I, it's simple. I, I think you just have to pursue the things you love. And then if you do that, good things will happen. Okay. How about you? Read and keep reading. Read and keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not good at that. 
Um, I think a passion for science, I, have, I fully agree. This is very, very important. And because um, if you're passionate about what you do, you overcome all of the hardships because it doesn't feel hard. And, um, and, Good advice. Yeah. And we do have a spectrum of people that are really interested in policy. And we heard a lot about trying to understand how politicians can help us in terms of our issues around water. When we think about looking for water on other planets and eco-planets, who's going who's gonna to pol who's gonna police that? Will we need to police that? Yeah. Or can I just you know, create the next system to go up there? Um, how is that going to be managed? Because it's really, we're dealing a lot with our own planet. Can we learn from this planet when we explore other planets? Any yeah. thoughts about policy related to this, John? Well, a, a great example of this is the last thing that Roberto presented was the discovery of water beneath the ice caps on Mars. And for all of us that read the paper, we said, oh, isn't it about time for somebody to have a mission where we land a spacecraft on the ice cap and just go right down into that stuff? But you can't because of planetary protection. We learned a lot from our cooperative uh, scientific engagement in Antarctica about sharing and protecting that last place on Earth. And in the context of that same spirit, we have something called planetary protection where we won't fly that spacecraft until it can be clean enough to not forward contaminate the planet. Thoughts from you? Well, I have been at a conference a few years ago about the possible uh, private exploration of the moon. And I raised the question, uh, what about the international treaties about access to the resources of the moon? Isn't there something like the treaties for Antarctica in place? And someone in the back of the ocean, uh, audience stood up and said, first come, first served. And if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. And, I, and, and I found out that guy was from a mining company. So I, <laughs> I, I had this vision of that guy on the moon in a spacesuit and, and, and a shotgun, uh, <laughs> defending his, his plot of land. <laughs> All right, so I think just to wrap up, I think we've heard a lot about the search for the um, unexpected, uh, the discovery. The maintenance of science and curiosity and, of course, reading. And then the thought that we can learn from perhaps what we might call our mistakes or misfortunes as we explore this wonderful universe that we're living in. Does that sum it up? Yep. I want to thank the panelists, and I hope that all of you have enjoyed this. And maybe now when you're about to have lunch and you're going to drink a beverage, ask yourself, where did that water come from? Or where did the water come from to produce this meal that I'm eating? So have a great lunch.